Hello, I'm Marites Vitu. Welcome to Southeast Asia Speaks. This is a show where I get to interview resource persons and newsmakers on issues affecting the region. I will be speaking to Drew Thompson, a visiting senior research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. He was also director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia in the office of the U.S. Secretary of Defense. We will be talking about the escalating tension between China and Taiwan, and also how this will affect Southeast Asia. We welcome our viewers to send in questions via the Facebook comment section. And uh, thank you so much, Drew, for making time for this interview. My pleasure. First, of course, uh, as we were talking offline, uh, the news about China and Taiwan, you know, is quite alarming. But maybe you can walk us through this issue. Why has there been an increase in Chinese plate fighters and bombers entering Taiwan's uh, air defense identification zone that is in the vicinity of Taiwan? So why is China upping the ante? So I think. China is concerned about the overall trends in Taiwan. Um, and, and there's a number of trends. There's a number of factors, including uh, the, the DPP's dominance in politics. I mean, this is the political party that is does not have a strong affinity for mainland China. Uh, public opinion and, and self-identity in, in Taiwan is growing increasingly independent of China. People tend to see themselves as Taiwanese, not Chinese, not mainlanders. Um, and Taiwan is politically moving farther away from the mainland. They're not getting closer. So, so I think these are very disconcerting trends that China is tracking very closely. So putting military pressure on Taiwan reminds the people and also the government, the leadership, of the cost of declaring independence or doing something provocative or unilateral. And so Beijing sees those military operations as targeting Taiwan as a signaling tool to prevent essentially an outcome that Beijing doesn't want, which would be a declaration of independence or other moves towards independence that would undermine, as Beijing sees it, the, the one China principle. So do you see uh, an armed invasion taking place in the next few years? Or maybe some analysts have, are, are saying they, it may be even an accidental war. So what's your um, fearless forecast? Well, it's very difficult to predict the future, as, <laughs> as they say. Um, and it's also very difficult to know what exactly is in Xi Jinping's mind. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of possible scenarios. Um, we know that China wants to unify uh, with Taiwan. We know that Xi Jinping has made that a top political priority. Um, and, and, and he's really linked it to his own political legacy. Uh, the China dream of national rejuvenation requires unification with Taiwan. So. From that perspective, we know how much China wants it, but I'm not sure it's going to happen right away. Uh, there's lots of factors that, that would cause Xi Jinping to pause. Um, using military force to unify Taiwan is really the worst option for Beijing. So their clear preference is for peaceful unification, and they state that again and again. The problem is that's not happening naturally. The, the, Taiwanese people are not gravitating towards China. So initiating a conflict for Beijing, which would most likely involve the US and possibly other countries, including Japan, would be very risky for Beijing, be very risky for Xi Jinping, and it would come at a very high cost. And it would also come with the possibility of failure. So, so this is not something that Xi Jinping would enter into lightly. And, and that also means the more time that the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, has to prepare for war, in their mind, the better. So I personally don't see a war starting by accident, not now, not even in the future. A mishap could occur between, say, a Chinese ship or a plane and an American one. But I don't think that China would respond to an accident by throwing in its entire military unexpectedly 
and honestly unprepared. So nobody wants to start that type of war. Uh, so I think an accident is unlikely to be the cause for a conflict. I think if there were an accident um, between US and, and, and Chinese uh, ships or planes, there'd be certainly a great deal of tension. There'd be a lot of signaling. There'd be some very uh, 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 choice words exchanged. But I think with neither side wanting a conflict and China potentially not prepared for one at that point, not having mobilized its forces, uh, an accident probably can be managed between the two sides. There are mechanisms, uh, hotlines, uh, informally what they call the secure telephone link and secure video link between uh, the president, between the secretary of defense and the minister of defense. Uh, there's lots of connectivity at high levels where they can communicate to defuse a crisis over time. And I think there's many in military jargon, they call them off ramps. I think there's many opportunities for the two sides to back down if there's an accident. Um, and then China will wait until it's ready to use force, but really as a last resort because um, it's being provoked to do so. Yes, you talked about Xi Jinping's political legacy. He wants this to be uh, part of his political legacy. Also, I read somewhere he wants it to be part of his personal legacy. Can you let us know what's in the what's behind the thinking of Xi Jinping? I mean, uh, he keeps there are he issues threats, and then he says, you know, this should be done peacefully. So, you're the expert. Please tell us. <laughs> so, so I think Xi Jinping's legacy is very much linked to achieving the China dream of national rejuvenation, as they call it, and essentially that would be making China both wealthy and powerful, and by powerful, I mean both militarily and politically, um, by the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China in 2049. So I think this is a clear goal that they've set. Um, and I think unification with China is, is most likely almost, I, I think almost definitely part of that China dream. Um, that said, I think you know, there is time um, uh, in 2013, Xi Jinping said when he just become the, the general secretary of the Communist Party, he said that the Taiwan question shouldn't be left to the next generation. And, and that's been inter interpreted as his tenure, right, his generation. And that was in, in a way a very implied threat. Um, and it created a sense of urgency on the part of, of, of many po people, both within China and externally. And because China is not going to unify peacefully in the current state, that implied threat would be that China, that China would use force to force unification before Xi stepped down. But I take a certain amount of comfort in that Xi Jinping hasn't repeated that phrase since 2013, and it hasn't been written into any of the major documents that have made up Xi Jinping thought, as it's called. It hasn't been written into the Constitution. So I think if you look at a lot of the recent statements that, that have been made, um, that are focused on Taiwan. You've got, you know, he gave a speech in October to, um, uh, or he, at the beginning of the year, he gave a speech to overseas Chinese. He gave a speech marking the uh, 1911 uh, revolution, which is very much geared and directed towards uh, towards Taiwan. And, and he made a lot of remarks at, at, at his talks with President Biden uh, a couple of days ago. And none of them gave a sense of urgency or set a deadline for unification or gave any sense of time to them. Well, he basically characterizes unification as a certainty, uh, an inevitability, an historic one, but it's not an urgent one. So it's very much part of his legacy in terms of the China dream, but his legacy has a, a an objective of, of unification, but it doesn't need to be achieved in his formulation for probably uh, a, a good number of years, uh, maybe 2049 is the one that they've stated. So in that respect, the internal political pressure on him is variable. Um, so I think it is conceivable that that some of Xi Jinping's, uh, maybe his compatriots, uh, his, his, his peers uh, within the Central Committee and in the Politburo, if they feel like they want to use Taiwan as a as a tool to put pressure on Xi Jinping, an internal party struggle. 
they could say to him, hey, you know, you need to reunify with 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 Taiwan to achieve your China dream. And then it's really a question of because that's not in debate. It's really then a question of time. Does it happen during Xi Jinping's lifetime or does it happen by the 100th anniversary of 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 the People's Republic of China? And if that's the case, then again, there's there's time for all parties to look for um, uh, ways for China to achieve its its you know its legacies, its its comfort, its uh, political objectives, uh, without necessarily resorting to to war. Uh, and there's ways for Taiwan to to bolster their deterrence uh, and to find ways uh, to peacefully resolve a very very great difference between the two. Yes, I, I'm going to ask you a question and then also add the question from one of our viewers. My question is, what can the U.S. do to prevent a conflict between China and Taiwan? And then Josh Cortez, this is a follow-up from him, how will the U.S. react when a war between China and Taiwan starts? That's more provocative. Though. <laughs> Those are both great questions. Um, so, so let me do them both justice. Um, and um, so, so, so your first question: What should the U.S. do to help yes. Taiwan? Um, uh, so, so I think the first thing you want to step back and kind of think about is what's the U.S. policy towards towards Taiwan? And, and the U.S. is obligated by law, called the Taiwan Relations Act, to provide Taiwan with arms of a defensive character. Um, and the law also requires the United States to, and the Department of Defense in, in particular, to maintain the means to defend Taiwan. So, so maybe to get to that second question, I consider that the, the baseline for what the U.S. must do under U.S. law. Um, and I'll get to that second question in a bit. But I think what the U.S. needs to do is in many cases con continue to do what they're doing. And one of the things that the Biden administration has done is, is, is reassure Taiwan um, of its commitment to Taiwan's security. And one of the ways they've done that is by essentially elevating the status of the um, Six Assurances, which uh, was a 1982 statement during the, the Reagan administration. Um, and what the Biden administration has done is repeated that phrase, Six Assurances, consistently when it, when it lays out what the US one China policy is. So basically the mantra is the US one China policy is based on the three joint Sino-US communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and the six assurances. And those six assurances were delivered to Congress and Taiwan in 1982 to, to reassure them that the US wouldn't pressure Taiwan to negotiate with Beijing. So basically the two sides work it out on their own. Uh, the US wouldn't act as an intermediary between the two sides, and that they wouldn't end arms sales. And those are the three most, most important ones. Uh, the other three basically are, are, again, more about stating what, what the US wouldn't do, that it wouldn't um, uh, uh, basically negotiate arms sales with Beijing. Uh, they, they wouldn't uh, change the Taiwan Relations Act. And then I think the last one was that the US wasn't going to change its position on Taiwan sovereignty. So I think those six assurances are actually a pretty good operating manual for the U.S. to manage cross-strait relations. And I think it's smart of the Biden administration to elevate and remind China that this is essentially the U.S. bottom line and that this is what the U.S. will do to create the conditions for cross-strait stability so that Taiwan can negotiate from a position of relative security, and I say relative, so that it can resolve the situation peacefully. So basically the US should keep reassuring Taiwan, at the same time, keep deterring Beijing from using force. Um, and you do that by international diplomacy, by signaling China clearly, um, and, and providing Taiwan with the means to defend itself. And I think that process of supporting Taiwan's ability to defend itself means focusing on asymmetric defense strategies um, and encouraging Taiwan to spend more on their own defense. Um, and transform their military to really meet uh, the, the very considerable challenge that the PLA presents to it. I mean, it's a big threat. So essentially creating space for Beijing and Taiwan to resolve their differences peacefully, and in particular to the satisfaction of the people on Taiwan being the smaller, the smaller party that, that is 
needs to be protected from coercion. So, so this is a, you know, this is a pretty big lift, but I think that's, that's what needs to be done. Um, so in terms of how the U.S. would respond, should China start to make the moves to, um, to use force to compel Taiwan, um, obviously messaging and signaling is the very first thing that one does as a conflict or as tensions mount, making it very clear about U.S. commitment. Uh, to, to Taiwan. I think the second thing the U.S. would do quite clearly would be rallying international support, working with uh, near neighbors, and that would include the Philippines, that would include Japan, that would include other U.S. allies and partners in the region and potentially around the world to convey to, to China how devastating for China the use of force would be. I mean, it's just as a, as a, as a international principle, using your military to solve a dispute is unacceptable. And having a global coalition of voices telling China that fact uh, would be hopefully enough to deter China from actually pulling the trigger and using its military to, to invade Taiwan. If an invasion actually happens, um, you know that, that would be a decision for the president uh, to make. Um, and that would be based on a lot of factors, how the U.S. would respond militarily, how much would be committed to a fight, how quickly it would be committed to a fight. And, and again, that would be the president's prerogative. And we can speculate what that decision could be, but we actually really can't know until the question is put to the president. And then I'm quite confident that the U.S. government, the U.S. military would respond to the president's guidance and directive and, and engage as they're instructed. So uh, there was a recent virtual meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping. Did this contribute to, do you think it contributed to, uh, you know, a warming up of relations? And because Biden mentioned about, uh, I'll just quote it, he says, U.S. strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. So, end of quote. And then a week or so later, the U.S. invited Taiwan to a summit, democracy summit. What does, is this a, a cross, sending cross, cross signals or it's part of the diplomacy of the U.S.? So I, th I think, I, I like the way you characterize it. It's part of the diplomacy of the U.S. I mean, I think one of the basic principles for diplomacy is you know an effort to both deter and reassure at the same time. And you notice I keep using those terms because those, those are the two most fundamental tools in the toolkit. Um, so to the Biden she uh, summit, uh, the the dialogue that they had in in November, I think it was constructive. Um, I, I think it marked an improvement in the tone of discourse between the two countries, and that is significant. Um, I wouldn't call it a detente. Uh, I don't think the two sides resolved any differences um, at the Biden Xi discussion. But what I think, and, and for a number of reasons, I think there's a lot of underlying differences between the two sides. There's a lot of diverging interests. Taiwan is just one of them. So I don't see the, the relationship fundamentally improving. Uh, it's also important to note that I didn't see either side making any concessions to the other uh, about the uh, about their positions. But that said, you know the tone improved, and I think improved communications between the two sides are are positive, particularly if they help set what the Biden administration has said they want to achieve, which are guardrails. They want to set guardrails to prevent the bilateral U.S.-China relationship from becoming. Um, Un unmanageable and, and deteriorating past the point of functionality. So what they need to do is be able to maintain channels of communication so uh, so the U.S. can both deter and reassure China as well that, um, that finding common ground and, for instance, not using force will gain China benefits and that doing things that, that undermine uh, regional stability and security will have very negative consequences. So, so I think the other thing that, that keeps coming up in the U.S.-China relations are you know sort of these other bigger global um, 
global issues. And, and some of that could be values-based and some of that could be issues-based like climate change. But so I think China inviting the Biden administration, or sorry, uh, the Biden administration inviting Taiwan to, to the, the um, democracy conference is, you know, it's a bit of a dilemma um, because obviously it's going to have a negative impact on U.S.-China relations and China's going to be upset. Uh, I think it's important to note that the, the participants are going to be a mid-level uh, official, um, uh, you know, sort of sub-cabinet level official from Taiwan and, and the representative who's already based in Washington in the Taiwan representation, the, the Taiwan uh, Tecro, the, the de facto embassy. So I think um, they're doing it in a measured way to manage China's perception, uh, basically using existing channels. I think the choice of the minister without portfolio uh, from, from, from Taiwan to come to the U.S. is also a, a very smart move because this is a person who's responsible for things like countering foreign interference and cyber issues and cross-cutting functional issues where the U.S. and Taiwan have an awful lot of, of common interest in cooperation. So in some ways, having this, high this representation from Taiwan, which is relatively high level, but not overtly political, it's more functional, I think is how they're, they're, they're threading the needle. Um, and not inviting Taiwan uh, would cause a credibility gap for, for, the, for the Biden administration. I think, you know, Taiwan's democracy is, is you know, it, it's, it's rollickingly free. I mean, if you look at what goes on in the legislative UN, it's full of, of freedom of expression and antics, and it's a very mature mature democracy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the press is also, you know, completely free and open. It even allows, you know, basically mainland uh, Chinese to have, you know, airtime and views and, and much of Taiwan's uh, media, mainstream media is actually rather favorable towards mainland China. So you couldn't, you, it's hard to spot another more democratic democracy than that. So not inviting them would I think really strike a blow to the Biden administration's effort. Um, so, so if your liberal democratic values are gonna be credible, then you, you have to invite Taiwan to an event such as this, even if it angers China, uh, because in some ways angering China reaffirms your values and the Biden administration has been pretty clear about its values. So if China decides that, you know, supporting a democracy is a rationale for them to, to use, you know, military and economic coercion to, to destabilize you know, a, a major economy in the region, then, then I'd say we have a, a China problem, not a Taiwan problem. Okay. On another top related topic, because you recently wrote about a concept, overall defense concept of Taiwan, and you said it's this is the way that we, they will win the fight that they cannot afford to lose. Maybe just broadly, just you know, in layman's terms, what is the core of this overall defense concept? Sure. Um, so yeah, I published a, a paper last month, um, a fairly lengthy paper in the U.S. Uh, National Defense University about Taiwan's overall defense concept. And it's basically discussing the evolution of their thinking over the last about five years on their defense. Um, and the overall defense concept was put forward and the titles have changed. And there's obviously internal struggle within Taiwan about how to posture their military for what's essentially a, 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 a very difficult task, right? I mean, you have a modestly sized military that's obviously well-funded, but but, and well armed by the United States, technically adept, but you know facing the largest military in the region uh, in the PLA with the world's largest navy by by number of ships. So so Taiwan faces this massive massive problem uh, that they have to solve, and that's how do you prevent China from invading, and that's the fight they can't afford to lose. So coercion, you mentioned, and you started the discussion about China's flights into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. I mean, that's not violating Taiwan's sovereignty. Uh, it's still operating in international, within well within international norms and international airspace. That's coercion. And that's very difficult to, to stop. But if Taiwan wants to maintain its independent uh, sovereignty and integrity, 
it has to be able to stop an invasion. So the question is, what do you prioritize? Do you prioritize a military that operates in peacetime, that uh, is able to send up fighter jets to intercept PLA bombers that are coming in the air defense identification zone? Or do you invest more in a small, nimble military that can survive fire strikes and missile launches at the outset of an invasion uh, and then live to fight in a pretty difficult environment when the PLA is bombing you and, and ballistic missiles are falling on your heads? Are you going to create basically a, a small asymmetric military that can shoot and scoot and run around and use essentially low profile platforms? Um, so the question is, do you invest in big ships that are easy to sink or do you invest in a lot of small ships? It's what they say, small numbers of stealthy, affordable things. Um, and, and that's the struggle because on the one hand, you want to have big vessels, big airplanes, high tech airplanes that you can use to demonstrate in peacetime your, your, your military strength. But the reality is those are easy to defeat early in a conflict by China. And it's what you have still surviving after several days, maybe weeks of bombardment to, to fight the invaders off is what's going to matter. And that debate within Taiwan's military is, is, is quite intense. And whether you invest in these big things or these small, mobile, camouflaged, hard to target things is, is, is the debate to have. And, and my conclusion is you have to have both. You need to have the, the large conventional force that will deter Beijing in peacetime and deal with gray zone coercion and have that asymmetric force that can survive to stop an invasion at these small mobile systems. And the overall defense concept tries to strike that balance, but also tries to take advantage of other uh, advantages that Taiwan would have. And that would be striking at the PLA when they're weak and when Taiwan is strong and doing things like using timing to your advantage. So instead of striking Taiwan or the mainland early in a conflict and fighting a defense in depth strategy, in, instead of working defense in depth, you kind of let the invaders come and then, you know, the saying, you know, wait till you can see the whites of their eyes before you shoot. And then target an invading force when they're in your littoral, when you have good surveillance, you're far from Chinese surveillance, far from Chinese air defenses, so that Taiwan would have maximum advantage. So it's, about, it's both about equipment and timing, and, and it's actively being debated within, uh, within Taiwan. And as long as resources are limited, I mean, nobody has an unlimited defense budget, Taiwan has to make <laughs> difficult choices. So, so that's the essence of the paper, and, and hopefully it, it helps stimulate debate both within Taiwan and outside, how to strike that balance between conventional and asymmetric forces. We have an interesting question from one of our viewers, Tina Kuyugan. Would, her question is, would China's demographic problem, rapidly aging population, serve as an impetus to make territorial moves sooner rather than later? Because she said, you know, occupational occupation of territories requires military manpower, you know, younger, more robust. What's, what do you say? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think the issue of China's demographics is really a systemic one, and it will impact all aspects of China's development, all aspects of its of Xi Jinping's objectives to reach, um, you know, a strong, powerful country. Um, and that said, while it's critical to 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 China's long term success um, and and a challenge to it, I think in terms of near term, mid term, you know, the next 20 years, I think China's population is large enough. It's per capita GDP is still low enough that they will not find a shortage of willing adult males who see um, a career in the PLA as a way out of the countryside or the way out of poverty or or, or to a better future, you know, money for education, better opportunities, good networks. So I think, I don't think it's gonna constrain 
the PLA from a personnel standpoint, um, I think China will have to start making choices between funding the PLA and funding social programs and strike a balance as, as government um, uh, payments to, to elderly people and uh, entitlement costs go up and revenues go down. So, so, so this is going to be a problem for, for, for China. But I think in terms of the, the, the Taiwan problem set that China faces, um, I think it's a, it's a minor factor at the end of the day. A final, <clears throat> sorry, a final question for you, Drew, is how will this escalating tension between China and Taiwan affect us in Southeast Asia? Mm. ASEAN has always said they don't want to take sides between China and the U.S. So uh, where does this leave Southeast Asia? That's a great question. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, obviously, Southeast Asians, um, countries individually um, should pay attention. And I think they need to consider carefully what the implications are for them should China decide to use force to settle its disputes. I think the prevailing view today is that um, it's foolish to provoke China. Um, it's because China is so big and individual states are so small um, that it's foolish to confront China um, because the risk of China's retaliation, of economic coercion, of military pressure and coercion is too great. So I think that the instinct of most of most Southeast Asian countries is to stay out of it. Say, we don't want to choose sides. This is not our problem. Uh, this is not our interest. But I would counter that it very much is their interest. I think a conflict in Northeast Asia involving uh, not just the U.S. and China, the world's first and second largest economies, it would also very much involve Japan, uh, which is the third largest economy and a major trading partner and investor in Southeast Asian states. So I don't think Southeast Asia can stick its head in the sand uh, and, 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 and simply opt out of a conflict. I think they have to consider what each individual state can do to deter China from making the decision to use force. So that could take a couple of forms. Uh, that could be you know, using things like the code of conduct negotiations with Beijing to reinforce these principles that you know, force should never be used to solve any conflict in the region, not just Southeast Asia. Because the implications are, I think, that if China uses force to settle its dispute with Taiwan, who's next? Um, it would be other claimant states in the South China Sea. It would be other countries with territorial disputes. Uh, that could be India as well. So I think the principle of peaceful negotiation and settlement and the renunciation of the use of force would be a step that a lot of Southeast <clears throat> Asian states could take. Um, ASEAN, I don't think, um, well, ASEAN certainly has tremendous merit. Um, it also has pretty severe limitations. And I don't think ASEAN as a grouping is really equipped to deal with this beyond something like the code of conduct negotiations. But I think, I think Taiwan's issue matters to Southeast Asian states uh, in a way that I think they need to appreciate and, and confront and they need to deal with. And, and not just saying that, you know, both sides should, um, should not let this happen because that's really a false equivalency. Um, China is threatening to use force, um, refuses to renounce uh, uh, the use of force. And I think that that harms the security of Southeast Asian states. And, and I think that discussion and dialogue really needs to, um, to mature uh, farther than it has so far. Wow, thank you, Drew. That was really very illuminating and at the same time sobering because we were, as we were talking about offline earlier, we thought, I mean, it's just quite alarming just to read up on China and Taiwan. But after talking to you, we have a, a better understanding of the cause of the tension and also what to expect. And maybe would you like to announce or not announce, but tell us the book that you're working on so we'll expect for it next year? <laughs> there are China watchers among the viewers. So I am currently working on a book looking at how certain countries respond to Chinese uh, influence and interference operations. Uh, essentially, how are select countries 
responding to China's more assertive foreign policy and diplomacy under Xi Jinping. Uh, and hopefully it will be out um, middle to late next year. And, and, and I would certainly love to, to come back on the show uh, next year and, and tell you all about my book. Okay, thank you so much, Drew, and to our viewers and those who have listened in. Thank you for keeping us company. And of course, we will. We hope to talk to Drew again next year when his book comes out. Thank you so much, and bye. Thank you.